when I saw that you'd had this article in Jacobin, uh, this uh, this this caught my eye. Uh, so uh, the article is called "The Republican Party is Waging a War Against uh, Personal Freedom and Free Expression," and you know I think this is something that like cannot possibly be pointed out enough because you get this like. I think there is a phenomenon where some people on the left, you know, ha- really have to emphasize the importance of free speech, and they say stupid things about it, and uh, this in turn creates an opening for, uh, you know, for the right to sort of, sort of, you know, like wrap itself in that flag. But I think that's all the more reason for people on the left who do care a lot about free speech to point out that it is just like complete bullshit that these these, these people are, you know at their best days, they are at least as censorious as liberals are. Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, um, and I mean, really, I mean, far more so, I think, in terms of putting, uh, I mean, putting laws on the books, using legislation to cr- quite aggressively curtail, um, you know, quite aggressively punish wrong think um, to uh, promote a, you know, very reductive and and, you know, very narrow and parochial view of uh, of society. Um, I mean, what, uh, you know, the, I wrote the piece, uh, a, a ways back now, I guess it was, uh, must've been early last month, something like that. But, um, I was motivated by, I mean, for, I guess, a couple of reasons. One was, um, that, I mean, I, yeah, as you said, I don't think this can really be written about enough. Um, but, uh, I mean, uh, the, the second reason I suppose was that of late, there have been kind of a suite of bills, um, you know, throughout the country, but in Texas and Florida specifically, there have been a number of bills that I think are quite emblematic of the increasingly illiberal and kind of uh, censorious and and really authoritarian streak um, that that's animating the the Republican Party. In fact, I think uh, since I wrote the piece, uh, in some ways that streak has kind of rotted. Uh, you know, it's gotten worse. It's uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know can't quite find the right word, but I mean, it's, it's degenerated and gotten, um, you know, even more nasty and, and vulgar with this stuff about teachers being pedophiles oh, and, Jesus, and that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, just in, in some ways, I'm sure someone's written about this. That seems like a kind of extension of kind of QAnon, uh, QAnon stuff in some way, which of course itself goes back to Pizzagate and all the rest of it, which is a rabbit hole. Um, you know, we, we don't need to go down, but, you know, uh, certainly Republicans can't stop talking about, um, pedophilia and with this stuff, it's, it's really no exception, but mm. it's, it's really not just the, the rhetoric. That's a problem here. I mean, we are talking about actual bills that are being put on the books by Republican governors. So, uh, and, and Republican so let's, 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 yeah, let's, let's talk. Yeah. Let's talk about a few of them. So, uh, so, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Florida. Let's, let's, uh, let's start there. Yeah, I mean, sure. So, um, you know, Florida, I mean, people will have heard about it. Um, the the bill that's kind of, um, you know, colloquially been referred to as the Don't Say Gay bill. Um, but this is a bill which, you know, they've tried to package with a certain, you know, with a certain kind of, uh, I suppose, to some extent, a certain kind of, re- you know, rhetorical caution. Um, it's very much just about uh, how things need to be age appropriate and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you actually look at the language in the bill, um, you know, there's text that refers to, uh, quote, classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity in kindergarten through grade three. Um, so it sounds like there's a kind of very narrow applicability mm-hmm. to the bill. But if you read further, there's a, a pretty significant, what I think is a pretty significant caveat to this, which is, um, or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. Which seems to me, and I think you know, critics um, in Florida have pointed this out. Um, I mean, it seems very clear a loophole that I mean, it's entirely dependent on what you deem age appropriate, and if mm-hmm. uh, and you know, we, and we 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 can infer, I think, what you know, the kind of um, socially conservative constituencies pushing this think is age appropriate, which is that there's no age where this stuff should be taught to children. Children shouldn't have um, a sexual education, at least not in any kind of public way. And if they do it, it, you know, it should be in the kind of, um, you know, should be in a kind of very narrow way that's approved by conservatives. Florida, of course, also has been a battleground around, um, 
you know, critical race theory stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one other thing that I think is worth bringing up here is there's a very particular rhetorical frame that, um, that the rights picked up um, in relation to uh, critical race theory, I think as well, but, um, or so-called critical race theory, but also in relation to kind of discussions about um, sexual education, sexual identity. And this is this frame of, of um, parental choice. So, you know, in some ways the right is very good at this and they do it. It's not just social conservatives, right? Fiscal conservatives have done this very well, uh, very effectively as well, right? Where they frame their whole argument as being about individual choice. It's all about, mm. it's all about, uh, you know, individual preference. It's, it's, it's actually a, it's kind of emancipatory because it's freeing individuals to make, you know, to be, to, it's freeing them from coercion and et cetera. So that kind of uh, move that we see on the right a lot when it comes to kind of economic debates, they're very much um, applying it here. Um, although, you know, you only need to turn to, to what's happening in Texas to see how uh, ridiculous and, you know, inconsistent that is as a, as a frame. Yeah. I mean, before we go to Texas, I, I, I do want to just stay on this, uh, a little bit for a minute because i think somebody could you know could say okay um if if all that sort of being prevented is uh like having lessons that are about these these subjects you know that and it's it's only through third grade you know that they have a that sort of you know that doesn't sound so bad right you know that they like like you might think like okay you know we're not uh uh you know like this this might be like a little bit like heavy-handed you know but uh you know but but it might not sound like a like a terrible outcome i mean what's your sense of the kinds of things that this you know this could be used to prevent well i mean i think really it's a sort of trojan horse for just eliminating discussions of all kinds of things that uh conservatives disapprove of or some conservatives disapprove of from public schools altogether. I mean, it's part of a wider and sort of, I think, incrementalist onslaught against uh, the teaching of certain subjects, I think, against public education in general. And and specifically, mm -hmm. I think, against the idea that uh, public education is kind of a social enterprise and that actually mm -hmm. it does have a sort of communitarian function and that there are mm -hmm. um, there are spheres of, of knowledge that, you know, you can contest and you can debate what belongs there vis-a-vis -vis sexual education or, or anything else, but there are spheres of knowledge that are not, um, you know, that are, that are, that are public and that are part right. of a kind of uh, consensual view, you know, consensus view rather of, of what, um, of what our, our shared knowledge is. And I think, um, you know, a lot of what, uh, a lot of what's, I mean, I'm not an expert, obviously, on the Florida, you know, sexual mm. sex ed curriculum, but I know from, um, I know from a, a very similar debate a few years ago in, uh, you know, my home province of Ontario here in Canada, uh, you know, debate around the sex ed curriculum that, you know, social conservatives created this whole demonology out of uh, an update that was being proposed by the then uh, provincial liberal government to the existing sex ed curriculum, which hadn't been updated in decades. And there was all this all very similar stuff about, uh, you know, pedophilia, all just all kinds of absolutely grotesque stuff, may, uh, charges made. And when you actually looked at it, I mean, it's stuff that I think the vast majority of people would find uh, pretty non-controversial. Mm. Um, and, you know, uh, and so once again, you know, I think uh, it's important to keep in mind here that um, a lot of the illiberalism of the, you know, contemporary right is happening in a context where conservatives both hold minority views, uh, views that uh, are not actually widely shared, but also are increasingly recognizing that they hold minority views. And so are resorting to ever more illiberal means to uh, impose those views on other people and to enshrine them in public institutions. Think back to the rhetoric of the 1980s, right? Remember, remember mm -hmm. the moral majority? Well, conservatives <laughs> don't really talk in terms of, you know, in those terms anymore. It's not the silent majority. It's not the moral majority. It's hey, we're desperate. You know, we're drowning and we're desperate in a world where um, you know liberal values are hegemonic, and that's why we have to basically you know rig state legislatures so that even with forty percent of the vote or whatever, we get a majority of the seats, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think that like it is really striking. I was thinking about this um, last uh, last Thursday. We were watching the Amari French debate that like. Uh, cause there's a point where Sora Bomari was, was bringing up gay marriage. I was thinking about how like, oh, they like conservatives used to 
love to wrap themselves in like the flag of popular democracy on that question, right? I mean, like if you if you uh, when the Obergefell decision happened that finally federally you know mandated uh, marriage equality. If you read like Galea said that it was all about how you know the Supreme Court is uh, you know overturning the vote the will of voters in different states and et cetera et cetera, and of course they can't anymore, right? Because because now it's 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 just so overwhelmingly obvious that uh, that the majority you know majority of um, you know the majority of people um, in the United States you know just just do not share. Uh, do not share that value. I also want to like really sort of circle and underline what you said about public education because I think that's a important uh, subtext to a lot of this, right? Like it's it's not a coincidence that uh, both the don't say don't say gay bill, um, you know, they which you know even if you think like okay, it's you know, is the bill really going to stop? Um, you know, like I don't know, is the bill really going to stop your second? You know, like the you know, second grade teacher from, you know, from, from like referring to, you know, you know, referring to his husband to, you know, to the students or whatever, right. You know, maybe not, you know, but, uh, but it's certainly at least an attempt to, you know, to like whip up a kind of moral panic about, you know, well, and about of course, sex. Po- and yeah. of course, potentially though, it, it actually, it actually could, uh, you know, prevent a second grade teacher from doing that because, um, you know, as in, as in Texas where there's, uh, you know, there are measures targeting, uh, you know, university faculty and threatening them with professional discipline. I mean, one of the things that uh, I, I'm not I'm not quite sure how far this is along legislatively, if it's part of the same package. But there's also an effort underway um, to make it uh, so that parents can can sue, right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, for you know, can sue uh, can sue teachers um, for you know violating these uh, you know kind of arbitrary and and you know uh, you know ever fluctuating standards that are set down. Um, by conservatives. So, you know, there's, there is, there are, there are some teeth to this. It's, you know, there's a kind of cautious language. There's a language around, you know, parental choice, which is designed to sort of give this an R of moral neutrality, but there are, um, you know, I think that there is, there are the potential, there is the potential for this to have a chilling effect. And of course, when we're talking about lawsuits by parents, I, I suspect functionally what that means is lawsuits by quote unquote parents who are actually members of, you know, well-organized yeah, right. and well-funded uh, social conservative groups, probably connected to mega churches and, and things like that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty sinister stuff. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that both that and the anti-CRT bills are, you know, ultimately about what goes on in public schools, you know, like, like, like does seem really, you know, like, like I think there is a, a subtext to this, which you, you, you kind of gestured at earlier, which is just like, look, I mean, above all, like there are lots of reasons why these people just don't like public education, right. As a, uh, as an institution, I mean, if nothing else, um, it's uh, a publicly owned and B what if the uh, what if the only um, you know like what are the only kinds of workplaces that's everywhere in the United States that's uh, that that's like by and large is is unionized right I mean like that they like like that those two things by themselves would be more than enough to you know to make the right hate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and just before we move on to Texas, there's uh, one one point I'd like to make about that. Um, and this mm-hmm. is a point that uh, has kind of come to me by way of uh, Jennifer Berkshire, who uh, you know has written for the Nation and 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 a few other publications, and has um, has a has a podcast about education. A, a point a point she made that I think is uh, really important to keep in mind here mm-hmm. uh, is that you know Democrats and liberals are particularly ill-equipped to address a lot of this stuff. To address the challenge, to address the the right wing onslaught against public education, um, because their own their own view of it has increasingly become a sort of instrumentalist and and um, or rather instrumental and and kind of um, you know economistic in some ways um, you know view of public education. Right? I mean, Democrats have increasingly talked, particularly since the Clinton era, you know, education is 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 an extension of the sort of neoliberal view of meritocracy, right? It's about Mm -hmm. bequeathing, uh, bequeathing you with skills that are going to help you on the job market because, you know, we, in, in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a steady kind of reconceptualization of, of people and citizens as just sort of, you know, um, you know, 
you know, economic actors, little atomized, you know, economic actors selling our labor, et cetera. And education is a big part of that. Um, so there's a very instructive moment, for example, uh, which is germane to all of this, actually, in the recent uh, Virginia gubernatorial election, which, you know, is thought of and, you know, in some ways, rightly, right, is this contest over, this was the big CRT contest, right. Republicans were able to kind of you know, and there's a comment um, that McAuliffe made, the you know incumbent Democratic governor who lost, um, you know, that was uh, very much, I think, widely seen in the context of the CRT discussion, where he said something to the effect of it. Perhaps it was in a debate. Something to the effect of, you know, well, of course, parents don't get to decide yeah. you know, uh, what their children learn. And um, you know, Jennifer Berkshire has pointed out that, well, uh, in context, uh, you know, what McAuliffe was actually saying was. Uh, something to the effect of, well, parents don't get to decide, you know, Amazon gets to decide, Google gets to decide, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you actually compare the, the Republican and Democratic um, education platforms in that election, uh, you know, they're very, they share a lot of uh, common ground in terms of, you know, allowing, you know, hu huge involvement from, you know, big corporate actors in, you know, uh, writing the curriculum and, and that kind of thing, or, or in being involved with uh, the curriculum uh, at any rate, because, you know, both have this kind of market view of education where it's not a social enterprise. Republicans just also tack on this kind of, um, you know, hysterical, you know, social conservative uh, agenda to that as well. But there's a there's a shared agenda between liberals and conservatives, at least centrist liberals and conservatives around um, this more instrumental view of, of public education, which in turn, I think, leaves them uh, poorly equipped to to you know, mount an intrinsic defense of public education as a social enterprise uh, in the face of this right-wing onslaught. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, I'll say, I mean, remember, you know, that election in, in Virginia, the, you know, there was this kind of ridiculous thing that, you know, that happened where they, you know, like the only acceptable interpretation on, you know, liberal and to some extent even left Twitter of like why, the election with the way it was, was, was racism. And I thought, well, hold on. Right. Like, um, like did Virginia just become way more racist between 2020 and 2021? Right. You know, when, uh, you know, Democrats were winning elections and, you know, losing, right. I mean, like that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, it's amazing how little we heard about what an obviously poor candidate Terry McAuliffe was. And the oh, exactly. That, you right. know, offer to voters was clearly not a compelling uh, one and that you know he's a guy with a background. I mean, it's a very typical story uh, that we've seen over and over again, right? Where it was, you know, it's a guy with a background in finance. I can't quite remember which you know grotesque mm -hmm. financial institution McAuliffe is attached to, but um, yeah, not a lot of people find that relatable. Strangely enough, um, yeah. you know, it and and yet you know the mainstream discussion about that election, you know, had a lot to do with uh, you know. Uh, yeah, the role of racism and stuff, but but also it was you know blaming uh, it was blaming the left, right? Because it's always the left's fault, even even and especially when you know sort of Clintonite uh, figures lose elections, somehow that's you know the fault of uh, that's the fault of the left. Yeah, well, that is right. I mean, that much uh, that much is for sure. But uh, but I mean, like to the extent that you know CRT, you know, did have to do with the you know, with the result, which, you know, I mean, certainly the Republicans were using it to whip people up. I mean, that much is, that much is certainly true. Right. You know, but like, I don't, I mean, I remember talking about this with Anna Kasparian and she, she just says like, okay, why did he engage with that at all? Why not just say like, it sounds like you want to run for the school board. I don't understand why we're talking about this. Right. But then like, if you were going to say that you'd then have to say what we should talk about is and have something that voters could actually get excited about, which, you know, for all the reasons you suggest is uh is the one thing that uh the one thing that you know somebody like McAuliffe can't really do right I mean, it's not like he has some great social democratic policy agenda you know that he could uh, that he could pivot to from that but you know to the extent that you do talk about CRT I mean I've something I've thought for a long time is that the the sort of way of talking about it where you accuse everybody who supports the laws of, you know, being a horrible racist is, you know, I mean, not always false, but like, is, 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 I also think not like terribly useful in a lot of ways. Right. Cause like, I think a lot of people it won't really resonate because, you know, if they're using that term in ways that I think are more standard, right. You know, where you have to have like sort of be consciously full of hate, you know, then, then I think it won't necessarily resonate, but I mean, I think the way to, to fight it, I should be, 
just to frame it as uh, as a free speech issue. Just say, look, do you do you want to live in the kind of society where people could openly discuss in classrooms, for example, controversial ideas that you know not everybody likes? Or do you want to live in the kind of society where there are state bureaucrats peering over the tail shoulders of classroom teachers? By the way, if you think that you know public schools are already too conforming and conformist to make them much more boring and conformist, you know, by like making sure that nobody says anything that the wrong the wrong parent or the wrong group behind the parent, you know, hearing it, you know, in an uncharitable context could interpret as being CRT. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really in a position to comment on the specific role of, of you know, that debate uh, vis-a-vis yeah. the the Virginia election. I, I think it's, you know, in some ways, uh, I mean, the only, the only thing I really have to say about it is, is that, uh, to me, it's still an open question. I mean, it's obviously a huge, um, in sort of the MSNBC versus Fox News, you know, wars, the you know, never-ending wars. It's obviously kind of a huge. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's obviously a huge kind of a p- polarity, a huge debate. But um, I don't know. It's actual kind of political currency. I, I'm not I'm not entirely uh, I'm not entirely clear on that yet. Um, I I would I, I suppose add though that I think the I mean again you know the right's whole kind of the way that it's framed that debate where it's you know it's about uh, yeah you know you know similar i think kind of uh, rhetorical frames used around parental choice you know it's actually freedom of speech in, in a sense not to you know not to teach yeah. these things not to discuss them um but again if you strip away that artifice and that kind of language of moral neutrality i think again there's just strip away the artifice and you find the prejudice i mean it really right. is just there's a deep discomfort on the right uh about addressing uh or even engaging with the, the very obvious fact that for the majority of you know America's existence as a mm-hmm. you know nation state, uh, Black Americans have yeah. not been you know legally considered full human beings, and that you know frankly a you know a certain whatever you know however you come down in the very you know the more granular historical debates around I don't know things like the 1619 Project or whatever. There's plenty of historical revisionism that is, you know, that is that is mm-hmm. urgently needed in in thinking about, um, you know, how American history is narrated, particularly in 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 public schools, because um, even if you know Black Americans have not been, uh, you know, treated by most of the society around them, you know, we're not treated by most society around them um, for, you know, hundreds of years as, you know. Uh, full human beings who are participating in the American, uh, you know, experience, they were, and that has to be a part of the, um, you know, that has to be a part of the public, you know, public conversation and, and, you know, the, the, you know, the canon of uh, public education as well. Um, uh, Although I would certainly agree with you, I don't think liberals have been particularly successful in making that case. And part of that goes back to um, the, the kind of, their their inability, I think, in a in a more holistic way to defend public education as a as a social enterprise, uh, but other other uh, issues being at play as well. Obviously, if we're specifically talking about uh, so called CRT, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and and, and like some of the wordings, that, you know, some of the wording of some of the CRT bills that I've I've seen, like would I mean, like a literally, like you'll get words like controversial, and then, you know, like all right, well what's controversial, right? I mean, that's, that's yeah. something, you know, something that somebody somewhere objects to, right? And so I think that, and in fact, there are, uh, there are provisions in some of them that are, you know, well, you can't portray like America or its history as, you know, as, as, as being, you know, racist or bad, basically. And it's like, well, okay. I mean, like, if I were a public school teacher in a state that had passed such a law and I wanted to keep my job, like, I would be very reluctant to broach a lot of very real history, you know, lest somebody interpret it as implied that. Right. And I mean, it's, it's deeply ironic, isn't it? That, you know, you really kind of peel back the layers there and what we're talking about when it comes to how a section of the right anyway, wants to talk about American history. I mean, it really is, uh, it's, it it really is so deeply ironic given uh, the right's embrace of all this stuff about snowflake culture and (laughs) hypersensitivity I mean, if you if you if you can't uh, if you want to ban discussions of the you know, I mean, completely. Uh, I mean, a fact that is impossible to object to, which is the that the founding of America, you know, the institution of slavery was 
you know, deeply implicated with that in that and interwoven with all of that and, and plays a formative role in American history. I mean, that really is just you want to ban ideas because they make you uncomfortable, not even because you disagree with them. Right. Because right. just the mere act of, of being the, 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 the anxiety that you might be exposed to them or that your children might be exposed to them makes you uncomfortable. And I mean, if that's not, you know, hypersensitivity or, or, or you know, snowflake culture, um, it feels a little kind of, you know, cheap to, you know, kind of pull, pull those, pull those things out. But I mean, that, that really does seem, seem to be, they do, do seem to be apt in the case of something like this. Yeah, absolutely. So, so when we're talking about CRT laws, um, they, like there's this kind of defense that you get in some quarters that's like, well, look, uh, you know, this, this isn't, um, you know, this isn't really, you know, free speech thing because we're talking about, you know, children and what's, you know, and, and what's, what's taught to children is like something that's a sort of legitimate, you know, thing for, for everybody to weigh in on. Uh, but uh, which, you know, I mean, look, I don't find that particularly convincing. I think that, like, I think in a free and open society, you know, a, a big part of the purpose of public education should be tr to train people to be good at critical thinking, you know, so if they could be, you know, citizens of democracy and that, like, part of the, and that part of that means, in fact, you know, having people talk about controversial ideas and, you know, and, uh, but also, even if you were convinced by that defense in the case of K-12 schools, one of the uh, bills in Texas that you mentioned is actually about universities. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so, you know, very similar to, um, you know, some of the other stuff we've been discussing, but um, yeah, I think not much even de more detail to recount here beyond what we've already said, uh, except that, you know, uh, you know, Greg Abbott um, and his administration have been pushing you know, this idea that, uh, or, you know, pushing this measure to, uh, you know, make uh, teachers and college fact uh, faculty face professional discipline, you know, if they transgress against, you know, standards that are handed down by politicians. In this case, um, you know, uh, st the teaching of so-called critical race theory, which again, I mean, I think it's notable as in the case of the Florida bill we were discussing, how the language here is, there's so much ambiguity in it, right? It's like, mm -hmm you know what i mean what 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 does that what does that actually mean uh how is that defined in this legislation again i think it's really just opening the door to anything that sort of organized in this case social conservatives don't like can potentially be you know a, a, you know ground for a you know a professional di you know professional discipline of college professors and others which again is notable and and is you know pretty pretty uh, potently ironic given the, the role of campuses, campuses being so central in kind of the right wing narrative about um, centurious culture. Campuses are the very center of that debate, right? Uh, or, you know, I don't want to call it a debate. I mean, they're the center of that narrative, right? That campuses are the place where you find the most centurious uh, ideas that are in turn kind of, uh, they percolate through the culture and, you know, they, 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 they inflect our public debates as a result of that. Well, here you have... Uh, you know, Republican administration in Texas, again, just trying to, uh, you know, ban uh, academics for, or, you know, p punish academics for, for wrong thick. Um, and that, and that's, by the way, not even the most grotesque uh, thing that the uh, Republican administration in Texas is, uh, is currently doing. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the things that they're doing that are more grotesque. I mean, uh, I mean, th probably the, 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 the measure that motivated me to write this piece more than any other was this, uh, you know, this, this directive that uh, Governor Greg Abbott issued, I guess, earlier this year to mm -hmm. the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, uh, basically to launch investigations into instances. And again, here the language is, you know, is deliberately sort of ambiguous and, and has, a, has a certain R of moral neutrality about it. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the idea is to give this department a mandate to investigate instances of what it calls abusive procedures related to, uh, you know, parents, uh, their children and gender identity. And so, but what it, you know, what it effectively means is that, uh, you know, the parents of, of, you know, children who identify as, as transgender can be uh, criminally investigated by this government right. uh, agency. Um, and uh, furthermore, that uh, licensed professionals of various kinds, including doctors, um, can now be, you know, they'll now be professionally obligated basically to play 
to play the role of snitch uh progressively right. you know obligated to 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 report uh you know to report parents um and so there's already an investigation um i'm not sure uh uh what the state of this is at, at present, but there's already investigation underway against um, two Texan parents um, uh, because as a result of this decree, one of one of them is incidentally an employee of this very department, mm -hmm. the uh, Department of, of Family and Protective Services. So again, in Florida, you know, uh, and in and in other places, there's been this frame of parental choice, right? The whole the whole uh, goal here is ostensibly to prevent the state from interfering in the sanctity of the family unit which is a basic kind of impregnable you know unit of society that you know we shouldn't foist controversial ideas on etc and here you don't find that logic being applied at all in the same way that you know the, the right is not applying when it comes to transgender people the same rhetoric or, or framing about you know individual flour uh, flourishing and um you know the you know mm. the uh, purpose of you know our society being organized to allow individuals to you know, be, be free and, and, uh, you know, flourish as individuals, et cetera. I'm repeating myself, but none of that is present. Uh, none of that is present in something like this. Um, and instead what you yeah. have is again, just a very heavy handed use of the state to enforce a particular view that, you know, once again is not, I think, shared by, um, anything close to a majority of, of, of Americans, let alone, I think probably Texas Texans either, though I haven't seen the local polling. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is really like, particularly egregious because as you mentioned, I mean, some of the, um, you know, some of these other attempts to sort of pass off, like, you know, censorship as a subtle form of freedom are about, um, are, are about, you know, parental rights, right. You know, that they, that like, Oh, you know, uh, parents, you know, should, should have the, um, you know, should, you know, parents should be able to decide what, you know, what, what, uh, materials their kids, uh, have, uh, you know, are exposed to which which ideas they hear. You know, all of that stuff. And if you if you disagree with that, uh, you're interfering in families. And in the uh, in the Texas, you know, the uh, the Abbott uh, order, uh, literally, uh, family. You know, like, you know, what they the order is to do is to make teachers, doctors, nurses, uh, you know, etc. Uh, is to deputize them as snitches to uh, have to make them report to the state for uh, for legal consequences any families who are making personal intimate decisions that uh, that the you know the Republicans don't approve of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I guess I'll just say as kind of a, a final comment because uh, regrettably I have to go in a minute. But um, you know, I think the the common thread in all this is that you know trying to parse some kind of I'm trying to trying to identify some kind of uh, you know ideological consistency on the part of the right here is kind of a fruitless exercise. At least, mm -hmm. I mean, what you're gonna what you're gonna find uh, with the right, and I think this is true both if you're just thinking about a uh, you know an individual moment like the present one, or if you're thinking about the right in kind of broader historical terms, you're gonna find a variety of rhetorical frames and and strategies and things like that that are that are used. But there's probably not going to be a lot of consistency over yeah. time. I mean, the right is very dexterous in the way that it uses, um, you know, in the way that it uses this stuff. Um, it's very uh, kind of malleable and flexible in terms of, you know, how it adapts its arguments to, um, you know, political circumstances uh, to be maximally effective. And so, you know, we already talked about how in the 80s, there's this language of the silent majority, the moral majority uh, that applied, you know, also to later things like, you um, you know, same-sex marriage, which you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. and that's just that's just nowhere to be found in in all of this. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there are, to a certain extent, it's worthwhile identifying the hypocrisy here on issues of free speech yeah. and free expression, which of course I, I I did. But at the end of the day, if we really want to understand what's motivating this, what I would say is that at the end of the day, I think on the right, oftentimes the arguments are are kind of. Um, they're kind of developed after the fact, you know, they don't uh, arguments, conclusions are not exactly preceded by arguments. Conclusions mm -hmm. are the beginning. There's a particular view of society of, that is uh, in my view, quite parochial and, and reductive. And that, you know, is, you know, comes down to a belief that, you know, uh, certain hierarchies are natural. People have uh, these very clearly defined social roles that are just sort of rooted in nature 
And most of the problems we have in society actually stem from society deviating from um, deviating from those hierarchies and and those kind of uh, you know that kind of natural order. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, it's important, I suppose, to some extent, to kind of pick apart these arguments because they're not they don't stand they don't stand up to scrutiny. You know, yeah. give them an argument as as yeah, the yeah. title of your show goes. But um, at the end of the day, what we're dealing with here is is a you know. Uh, is a particular uh, a particular narrow view of of uh, you know human nature really um, that can't really be negotiated with in some ways. There are no when you strip away the artifice that I think you know it, you know is is kind of comprised of these arguments that are constantly in flux, these rhetorical frames that are always changing. Um, what you just have is a kind of reverence for hierarchy, and uh, you know ultimately in dealing with the right, that is what we're up against. No, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I, I think that, you know, I think it's worth pointing out the inconsistency just because, um, you know, I mean, look, it, it might be old hat to us, but they're they're dropping new humans every day. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, there's always somebody who, who has yet to encounter this. Uh, and, and, there's, and, you know, there are always people who are at like some stage of a journey of realizing these things. Uh, and, uh, and I also, you know, and I also think it's, it's just, you know, there's some real value in like, you know, I remember Elizabeth Brunig saying, you know, that the half the point of a debate is to get the other person to tell you what they really think. And, you know, I, th I think the more clearly you can kind of back people into a corner where they're really articulated this, no, we actually just think that hierarchy is natural and good. Uh, the, uh, the more useful that is. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>